Mr. Jason Bader, how are you? Oh, fantastic, Dom. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you as well. You know, you were a guest on the other podcast about a year ago. You were on the cabinet making one. Now I've got I you was. on Profit Tool Belt. Oh, very nice. <clears throat> yeah. You are just a podcasting guy, man. Well, I've got a face for radio, as they say. <laughs> Indeed, so do I. <laughs> but then they're dragging us to video. What are we going to do now? I know. Well, you've got to make the most of it. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm actually excited to have you back because there's a problem I keep encountering in the field. Okay. with contractors around wasted time and effort and purchasing and distribution. And when mm-hmm. I say distribute, like movement of stuff, people, goods, stuff. Right. And you're the expert at that, which is why we called you up and said, hey, you should come talk to us. Well, perfect. Uh, before we get too far into it, though, Jason Bader, yeah. who the heck are you? And how is it you come to be speaking who to this group of forward facing well, business owners? Gotcha. Well, I born in distribution, uh, You know, grew up, started uh, when I was you know, 13, my dad broke a few child labor laws to get me involved with the uh, construction supply business. And so, you know, I've been driving forklifts longer than I had a driver's license. So, you know, this is kind oh, of in my blood. So this is this is really what I do. And so for the last, uh, gosh, now 18 years, I've been advising distribution companies, all different vertical markets, but I tend to like the construction related uh, markets because that's what of I course. grew up in. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I advise them on all kinds of either operational, a lot of strategic stuff nowadays. Sometimes that translates into business therapy. You know, it just, it's kind of goes where it goes. Well, that's actually how you and I originally met, which is from a woodwork, a, a wood and supplies distributor. Yeah. Who's, yeah. Who had worked with you. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it doesn't matter. Guy. It doesn't matter whether I'm inventorying HVAC equipment or probably gravel and sand. It's the same thing. Everybody wants to be terminally unique, but they're really not. It's just, you know, it's, it's buy some stuff, put it on a shelf, hope you sell it for more than you bought it for. I mean, that's, that's really what it is. Yeah. Well, there's a bit more to it than that. You know, in one of my previous businesses, I had, I know there's a bit more to it than that because it's your entire career. But one of the things that I, I learned when I was running one of my past companies, I had a, uh, I don't know if you know, but I, I started a business selling used junk on eBay. Oh, really? No, yeah, I we got in a little bit of trouble because we were o- over inventory and we couldn't store stuff very well. We couldn't find it more, more is the point. More, yeah, more the case. Yeah. And I'm like, this is a disaster. So I sat down and reinvented the company on paper, a strategic plan like you yeah. and I would do for anybody else. And I said, we have to reinvent ourselves. And so I, I said, I need to, there's long math here and there's a whole bunch of funny mistakes. But I said, well, I need 250,000 used books in inventory if we're going to reinvent ourselves. I made a couple of mistakes. One is I didn't do the volume calculation on how much space 250,000 books would take because <laughs> Dommy's a dumb dumb. And, and, and then, you know, we did a pretty good job of understanding the costs because I bought them from thrift stores, which is a whole bunch of funny stories on its own. Sure. But sure. I used to tell my, my crew, listen, that book owes me rent. If sure. it sits on the shelf, if I got it for free at the end of a month, it might owe me 10 cents. So I got to, it either, either has to sell for more than that, or it's got to go. Mm-hmm. And so that's, I'm done with my distribution knowledge right there. You've got all of it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fascinating. And a lot of, you know, I'll, I'll just, as a quick aside, a lot of distributors don't understand that, that, you know, that, you know, that space that is consumed, you're right. It owes you rent for that. And sometimes yeah. we call it carrying cost in my world, but uh, you know, that's exactly it. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, a lot of the people listening here have yards or shops where they've got aluminum yep. siding stacked up or, you know, tons of material, old material. that's just sitting there. And let, why don't we let you talk about that instead of me? Cause yeah, I'm not the expert. <laughs> I'm just, I'm the question guy. So, t- but today our topic is you've got a screw loose. How, Indeed. <laughs> how did we, Indeed. how did we come to that topic? I'm of, not quite sure how we came to the title, but he said, Hey, that's the working title and that's the working topic. So we're going to leave it in place. We're going to leave it in place. Yeah. 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 What, what do we want to tell people who are running a company that we've got goods, you know, we've got people moving in and out, we've got money moving right. in and out, but also importantly on the shelves and in the yard and on the racking, we've got stuff sitting there that moves in and out. It does. Yeah. Tell us some hot points that we need to watch for to make sure we're not wasting time or money. Well, I, I think one of the big things is recognizing what we do. So let's say we own a shop and we're a cabinet maker or a, uh, we are an OEM furniture shop, just for, for example. Sure. Um, what are we good at? Well, we're good at capacity. We're good at you know the craftsmanship of this. Uh, we're good at designing. Maybe we're good at marketing. But rarely, rarely are we good at materials management. 
Right. And, you know, to your point earlier, a lot of folks, you know, they're really good at selling stuff because they're passionate about the, the finished product or the stuff. Yeah. But it, it's all the things that go into that, you know, finished product where they, they have a little bit of a challenge. And that's where distributors actually are pretty good at. You know, that's what we, you know, as the distribution side, that's what we, that's all we do. We don't right. make a darn thing, generally speaking. I mean, occasionally we dabble at it, but we're terrible at it usually. Right, but a roofing a roofing distributor <clears throat> just carries yeah. roofing products that Absolutely. I go and buy when I need them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's the thing that they uh, they are good at, at the in and out. You know, they've, they've learned that over the years. They've learned how to manage that so they don't have the exploding inventory and they have mm. room on the shelf to bring in new products. When products expire, they get dead or they uh, lose favor with the contractor. They've learned to move those out. Now, unfortunately, what happens is, you know, in the contracting side or or the end user side, they tend to accumulate stuff, you know, and they don't know how to manage the in and out. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the next thing they know, when they're going to go get this material and they're trying to produce whatever they are doing, it could be obsolete by this time, uh, could be the wrong products, stuff that, you know. Could have expired. There's a lot of different problems well, and cash flow dra- you know, yeah. drama there. The, one of the things, and you probably see this as well on the distribution side, is when when you know the people listening to this show are trying to re- return product that was stored improperly is now damaged, and there's a restocking fee. And for us, that seems like a problem. Like, why would you be charging us a restocking fee? And you're like, well, you left <laughs> all those asphalt shingles in the sun first, right? <laughs> right. In Texas, sure. second. Yeah. And yeah, third, right. you opened all the packages to check the color. Fourth, right. you, you know, but that's a reality of the situation. Sure. What do I do as a business owner to, you know, make that return better or to, to work with my distributor so that that's easier? Well, I think, Dom, um, it really comes down to better communication between the two of you. Uh, that The distributor actually should take on that responsibility with you. Um, if they mm-hmm. really want to be a good supplier to a uh, uh, to in this case, you know, let's say a roofing contractor, mm. um, <clears throat> they need to know what that contractor has been buying and, and make sure that what they have stored for one reason or another and have not consumed, that it's not going to go and deteriorate on them. They need to get learn to get things out of the people's hands as fast as humanly possible. That's really what, that's really what a good distributor will do. They'll really, too many poor distributors, and this happens with manufacturers too, is that they will load you up as that consumer and they'll walk away there. You know, I got my commission. The responsibility is done. A good partner in the channel actually makes sure that you have the proper uh, materials and you're not going to get stuck holding the bag. Hmm. You know, the worst thing they can do is, is make you have to uh, deal with some restocking nonsense or any of that. If they had been doing their job in the first place, we wouldn't have gotten to this problem. So I think that distributors really need to do a better job working with, you know, uh, you know, in this case, let's say that again, it's a shop owner or something like that, you know, an OEM producer or even a roofing contract. They need to do a better job really looking at what are they consuming. Beautiful thing right now is we all have the data to do that. Right. In the old days, yeah. you had to go and you know point your finger at stuff and write it down and all that. No, you don't have to do that anymore. That the data collection side in the ERP systems that most distributors are using today, they they really intuitively understand, and you can pull reporting out of there, and right. you can see, hey, you know, this person, you know, maybe sitting on this, they haven't ordered this for a while. I can I can talk to you intelligently about what you've been buying. I think that's so, the bigger piece. So I could go back to my, let's keep using roofing as it's a great sure, example. Sure. There's lots of, lots of roofers listening. Apologies <laughs> to all the electricians, plumbers and cabinet makers here. <laughs> but um, if, if I have a question, I, like I don't know how many gray shingles to stock or how many of these uh, eco-friendly shingles to stock. I could go to my distributor and say, hey, could you pull a report and tell me how much we did last year? Absolutely. So I know yeah. and how much I should keep in stock so I don't get caught. You know, right now, globally, there are problems. You may have heard of Ugh. this. I- <laughs> You know, I heard an inkling. Somebody, you know, somebody mentioned this the other day. Yeah, and it's it's hard to get certain things. Yeah, you know, and um, but yeah, that's a good point. I could go to my distributor in advance and say, you know, I this is what I expect to be buying from you this year. Mm-hmm. And a distributor should be open to that. They should be, and it also helps them plan their purchases, especially as we have a very difficult time 
procuring product from the distribution side, mm. the more intelligence you can get from your end users and your customers to say, okay, this person, this person, this person, this contract, all of these folks are going to be consuming approximately this. And in distribution, we think in terms of months. We always, you know, when we're procurement, it's always in terms of months okay. supply. That, that's yeah. just kind of a, a common. So we're going to be looking as like, okay, there's some usage here, usage here, usage here. We're going to accumulate that so that when we are making purchases to uh, the manufacturers in this case, then we have much better data to work with. We have, we, we've have got a much better crystal ball. Yeah. So you guys know how many containers of, again, eco shingles to bring in. Totally. To do totally. that. Yeah. You know, again, it's always going to be speculation, but at least if we have a little bit more intelligence, then no, nobody gets caught holding the bag in that supply chain. Here's what I think somebody's saying listening to the show right now. But Jason, I'm stuck with a the counter person. They're kind of crusty. I don't get much love from my distributor. <laughs> oh, sorry. For those of you not watching the video, <laughs> Jason just laughed and dropped his head. So what do, what do I do if I want to have, I truly want to have that right relationship with the distributor. And, and again, I want to remind everybody listening, we're talking about the distribution of anything. It could right. be fasteners. It could be lumber. We just happen to be picking on roofing and cabinetry, sure. but it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a distribution company is a distribution company. Absolutely. And so how do I, how do I, how do I level up the relationship at the distributor? So it works better for me and my company, for me and them, sorry. Well, I think that, you know, the, the concept that the distributor would like to put into uh, most organizations is something called vendor, uh, vendor managed inventory, VMI. Huh. And this is a, you know, a concept you might've heard, you re, uh, I'm sure your listeners, a couple of them might've heard, you know, somebody come to them and say, Hey, could we manage your inventory for you? You mm. know, we'll put in bins and, and, uh, you know, very popular in the industrial space, yep. uh, the yep. tool cribs and things like that. Uh, but it has tremendous application in the contractor world. Uh, and, you know, my family business has been doing, you know, they did this for years and years and years and years, you know, and I think what the contractor would do, I mean, if their menu, if the distributor hasn't already gone and offered this service is talk to them about, Hey, how can you help me manage the consumable products that I have in my shop? Mm. And that's start that's starting the conversation right there. And if a distributor is worth their salt, they're going to be stepping back and saying, "This is a tremendous opportunity." <laughs> yeah. Can you can you just go back for a second and define? Because sure. I think I know what it is, but I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. What are consumable items? Because that's not how we talk as contractors. What's a consumable item? Well, it's I think a consumable item could be anything that's left in the finished good or in the finished product. So, you know, a fast uh, fastener Fasteners. is a wonderful. Okay. Yeah, that's a wonderful application. Nuts, bolts, screws. Cams in the cabinetry industry. Wire. Uh, edge banding, things like, that, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. Sure. That's really good. Um, in the Jansan world, it's like, uh, oh, it could be safety piece, safety equipment. Sometimes it's gloves and, uh, and uh, razor blades and. PPE, it really can be anything that is uh, consumed on a regular basis. And right. you're going to be having to buy this over and over and over and over yeah. again. I mean, and honestly, with any uh, relationship uh, in the supply chain, generally speaking, there's going to be anywhere from 30 to 100 items that are bought so frequently that you could almost just kind of call them a given, you know? Ah, so that's. That sounds to me like a good place to look for waste and wasted yes. cost and wasted profits. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do, do you do you ever do the calculation on how much it costs a contractor, the people listening to this show, to put one person in one truck for one trip to the distributor? I have not, but I uh, always used to do it from the distributor side. Okay. And I'm sure you have a good one because- uh, Well, you know, I mean, for, it depends on ahead. the company, but I usually use the number 600 bucks, but it depends on- the labor rate and the market, but it's, it's not zero. It's not just a one hour trip to the store. It's about 600 bucks. Absolutely. And I think the big thing here, Don, is the opportunity cost. If they are leaving whatever their application is, you know, to go and procure a two or $3, uh, you know, yeah. ham or something, like that, or or something like that. Yeah. Right. That's just silly. I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. And so I think that the really the big win here and the big labor savings and the dollar savings comes from identifying those commonly used products. 
Right. As I said, you know, it can be anywhere from 30 to 100 to 200 of these items and have a representative inventory on in the shop and then let them uh, let the distributor manage the in and outbound of that those products. So you don't have to get in your car for 600 bucks an hour and, and run down and go get them. That's just I mean, that is really poor use of of, uh, of your talent. To do that. Well, and it's and it's just pure waste. And and yeah. people listening might say, you know what, Dom, we actually have this solved. We never send our lead guy. We always send the helper, the apprentice, the junior guy, or gal. But that's Still that's expensive. waste too, because you've now Still. just taken the helper who's supposed to keep the senior person working at their doing the most important work, and now they're working solo again. And if they were just going to that this, that supply oh, yeah. and this going the back directly yeah. without any stops there's, in between. You mean there's no Dunkin' Donuts on the way? No, exactly. It's like, you know, Timmy's not, you know, you can't get in there. So, yeah. no, I, I think that, um, you know, the important thing to understand is that we want to keep people working, you know, in their application and, and where their environment is. Mm. And so, I mean, <laughs> frankly, that's why we have DoorDash and different <laughs> food delivery services. So we don't have to leave. Yeah. Keep yeah. going. And okay, so kind of the way that whole VMI system works, you know, in a really good application is that the distributor and the uh, and the contractor in this case, they identify so many products, you know, that are consumed, what I would say repeatable, consumable. I don't need to get into my vehicle to go get. Right. And so you we put those on a shelf, a bin system of some sort, and we determine a minimum quantity you want on hand. And a maximum. Uh, so a min max. And it could be exactly. gate hinges. It could be cleats. It could be nails and screws. Yeah. Doesn't matter Absolutely. what it is. Doesn't really matter. It tends to, I, I tend to see more small items. Like for example, I have a, a friend who uh, his company is family businesses in the O-ring business, you know, and these are. Of like, course he is. That is the most yeah, random. The O-ring business. That's I'll just, of course. Yeah. Well, I, I think you, you've seen this as well. There are a lot of ways to make money in this world. And, and they're uh, not all exciting. Some no, of the most no, it's just, it's under so the fun. radar. Yeah, Totally. Yeah. So anyway, highly consumable product there. And, uh, you know, so it can really just be about anything uh, that's in there. Some people got into the vending machine world. You know, they I, got into those vending machines. Vending machines are great for small really expensive products. So think about like cutting tools. Yeah. Relatively like 60 bucks sometimes each tiny. Can, can I, can I just back up for a second? Cause yeah. I've seen these vending machines on site Yeah, and you've seen them, but some other people here may not have seen that. Can you describe to me what we're talking about? Cause I know sure. vending machines are huge in Japan for everything. <laughs> huge in Japan. Big, in Japan. big in Japan. Actually, it really is big in Japan. By <laughs> it way. really is big yeah. in Japan. Yeah. Um, sorry. Can you define that for us? So people have an understanding sure. what we're talking about here. So um, this was really born in industrial distribution primarily. And uh, you had these, essentially it's just, it's a vending machine, but rather than having snack foods in there, you would have products right. that would be used again, consumed by that, uh, you know, that end user. Right. You know? So a cutting blade or a, a special tool or a- could be anything. A lot of people used to put safety glasses and gloves and things like that in there. Yeah. And what was, what I've seen over the years, and they're very expensive, by the way. You know, the, uh, the vending machines themselves are, could be $9,000, you know, then you have the software hookup back to the, you know, the distributor yeah. ERP to know when something was, you know, taken from the, uh, consumed. you know, from the machine. But yeah. I, but I coded in against the, the job or I coded in, I guess I could code it in for personal use as well. Right. You could. Um, and, and that, that's also a little bit of a rub as well, because that's, God, that's just another step. Mm. Another step, and it doesn't get as exciting. Anyway, from a distributor perspective, I think they're terrible. I mean, they're just, I think they're, <laughs> okay. so, they're just too darn expensive. Um, but anyway, you take that same type of concept and you kind of remove a lot of the uh, cost associated with that. And there's some systems today where you set up again, you know, as I said, 30 to 100, maybe 200 SKUs that that okay. particular, um, you know, roofing contractor would use on a regular basis. And then I'll put them on shelves in their, you know, main facility. And we would either scan using barcodes, you know, scan in and out to count. Often uh, you'll have a distributor salesperson go and physically inventory them yeah. on a weekly basis. Yeah. Horribly expensive way to do it. But it's, but it's really great for the contractor, by the way. It's fantastic. Well, it's but, good for relationship. 
Yeah, it is right. actually because you do get to see them on a weekly basis and they bring food and, you know, it's usually pretty yeah. nice. Uh, it's a nice deal. Yeah. Um, anyhow, though, think about the savings on that contractor side, you know, that as they deplete one of these SKUs, mm. eventually, you know, within a week, generally on a week's time, it becomes replenished. And so they're never having to run out to that distributor. Oh, I ran out of this very inexpensive item and I'm going to send a very expensive person to go get it. I see. We don't have that anymore. And so when we, uh, when we develop these types of relationships, it's really beneficial for the contractor from the, dist- the distributor is getting a good deal as well. They're getting, you know, repeatable orders. They're getting that relationship building. They get, you know, both sides get something out of the deal, but I honestly think the contractor is getting more out of this relationship than the uh, distributor. Yeah. It, there's so many asset uh, aspects to this. One of the ones that comes to me is waste. You know, I was joking about asphalt yes. shingles being left in the sun, but I had a, this is one of my first coaching clients. This is a hundred years ago, right? He made pool tables. So he wasn't really a furniture maker. wasn't really a cabinet maker, but he made pool tables. He's an OEM guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're, making, right? you're making stuff, right? Yeah. And he had the felt, you know, the felt covering that sure. he, it was stored at the back of the shop uh, on the racks. And you probably already know what's going to happen here. So the, the city he lived in only had two seasons, snowing and melting. That was it. <laughs> That's all there is, right? So, but what happens is people would walk through the puddle that was just behind the overhead door and splash the felt. Well, once you uh, splash felt, the felt is ruined. Yeah. And so the, the, the finisher comes and he cuts off two, three feet of felt to start again, sure. to get to the clean stuff, right? Um. And so this was a huge amount of waste and it all stemmed from the fact that this guy had moved into this facility years before really fast because he was growing fast and they just put the felt on the existing racks standing in a kind of an open-sided box that was built on the floor near the overhead door because it's the final step in production. And it got worse after they had ruined, let's say a bolt of the green felt, they would go around the corner and pick more green felt that had been sitting on the shelf for months Instead of doing, well, you already know, just in yeah. time or just yeah, knowing yeah. your inventory better. Yeah. I mean, oh, it's really, it, it's inventory rotation, you know, it's stock rotation and things like that and, and really paying attention to, and that's where you, if a, if that person had a good relationship with a distributor of the felt product or whatever the consumable products were, you yeah. know, that the, they would say, Hey, we keep having to waste this stuff. And a good distributor is going to look at them and say, I think I can fix that problem. Now, it, it's interesting because you would think, does the distributor really want to fix that problem? Because honestly, I know in my mind, I'm like, why would he fix it? That's your problem right, and my, right, right. my upside. But, you know, and that's actually, you know, the, uh, what I found out with those vending machines and Fastenal is a big organization, you Huge. know, it's very massive. I had the opportunity, I met the CEO, a previous CEO, he and I were speaking at an event. And he was talking about their vending machine rollout. And we were talking about, talking about, he said, you know, what's ironic about these things is we, we keep wanting to put them into places all over, but they actually reduce the spend of each of the installations, each of the places we go into because oh. we're reducing waste. Oh. And I thought, well, you're a dummy. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you, and he started laughing. He's like, yeah, we're not, we're not always as smart as we think we are. So uh, he was a pretty so good it reduced, guy. It reduced waste, which reduced their it sales. It did. And re- exactly, exactly. And so yeah. uh, same thing here, the distributor, you know, they're still wanting to do, you know, believe it or not, the distributor actually does want to do right by that end user. You know, they want to make sure that they keep them running and keep them working because let's face it, the contractor, whoever that end user is, they are going to favor those individuals who think about making them money mm. going forward. And, and so there's a, there's that loyalty points, you know, being built up. Right. When we, um, when, when we look at a company that's buying stuff, yeah. you know, this is our, who we're talking to here, that restocking fee becomes a thing. Mm-hmm. How do, and, and sometimes, you know, there's an argument, Oh, they don't want to take it back or they gave us the wrong price. And uh, there's a whole bunch of things, but let's stick to restocking fee. How sure. do I, how do I make it so that that the distributor will take the product back and that I get the most I can for it? Because mistakes happen. There's overruns. You know, it just happens, right? Hey, you guess wrong. I mean, it happens. Yeah. You guess wrong. I mean, it's okay. You know, yeah, that's that's called all... blackjack. That's, that's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> guess wrong. Guess guess wrong that time. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing Adam, is is keeping that 
window from purchase to mis- you know to recognition of mistake short. Keep it fast, right? Yes. Yeah, return those slides and glides fast. Return get whatever. Him, it get is. them back in the hands so that distributor can re you know resell them to someone else. Try to keep them in the best possible condition. Um, again, this is where you know a nice bin system tends to work really well because we're not. You know, they're not on the floor on a pallet somewhere getting kicked around or in a box somewhere um, collecting dust. I I mean, the more you care for that product and and really it's the resellability. If an item is in its original package size and undisturbed, distributor's not going to have to charge you any restock fee. I mean, as long as you get it back to them. And I think sometimes most distributors are going to typically eat that anyway. Um, Oh, okay. They they do. Look, (laughs) I mean, okay. Big secret here. Distributors are spineless in many cases. You know, they just let's, let's talk more about that, Jason. Everybody <laughs> just turned the volume up on that. I know it. Well, I mean, like distributors tend to really over um, overtake, you know, they, they really want to take care of their uh, customers. And they often tend to not get paid for those services. So uh, you know, I, I try to coach them to do other things, you mm-hmm. know, to get paid. Yeah. But um Generally speaking, the uh, a good distributor always wants to make sure that that customer is not getting uh, stung. Okay, you know, with, with with products that are they don't need. So you're saying the restocking fee is not the policy. It's not going to happen every time. I could. It's not I could have time. a conversation it's, here. And yeah, it's if you. Um, it's really if you kind of abuse the system there, if you're trying to return something that's, you know, 18 months, two years old, mm. uh, you've banged it up a little bit and going back to the shingles, you know, that they're discolored. It's really comes down to, can I resell this product? Right. Or trying to return something that is a previous model when you have a new uh, upgraded item, sure. you know, that is actually out in the market space. Um, you know, that's not going to be very attractive to people either. So I, I think it's really better communication and not uh, not becoming a hoarder. Let's face it, the end user should never have a lot of inventory. That's what a distributor is for. The more inventory that, hey, okay, quick quick distribution adage, but I think it works. You know, for the OEM sure. as well, is uh, more bad things than good things happen to anything we bring in stock. More bad things than good things happen to everything we bring in stock. Yeah. Yeah. Yikes. Think about it. So on the distribution side, I always talk about the one good thing that happens to anything I bring into stock is I sell it. Sell it. It's That's the, the only good thing that happens. But if I don't sell it, you know, I can damage it. It goes obsolete. It gets stolen. Um, yeah. all, all these negative things that can occur. And think about in the shop, for example, mm. only one good thing happens. It is consumed. It's processed the and only turned good into thing. higher value item and sold. That's the only good thing. So a lot me, of bad stuff happens too. Let me boomerang off that then. So let's yeah. learn from your distribution experience. Now yeah. that I am a roofing company or an HVAC company, I've got inventory, yeah. uh, cabinet company, I've got inventory. Yeah. What do you guys do? What does the distribution do when you've got old inventory, stale inventory, inventory that won't move, inventory that's damaged? What can we learn from you about that same situation at our shop, in our warehouse, in our manufacturing floor, in the truck? Our number one... Um, uh, our first line of defense is always to try to return that back to the supplier. Back to your right. supplier. That's correct. So putting it's it back in a container at, and sending it back to China, is that what you guys try to do? That would be the bad one. Yes, that is the most challenging one. You're right. If we are in the import business, then that's not going to work well. So we go to plan B. Typically, right. any distributor worth their salt is, uh, because uh, dead stock is a huge part of distribution. It's just mm. something we understand and we play with. We, we know it's there. But it's how we manage it and how we dispose of it and how we, mm. you know, we we don't let it become this massive pile. So you start with return to supplier as a possibility. If that doesn't work, then our next option is uh, learning to bundle it with with good product. Mm. So we take a good item, bundle it with the bat. So for example, we might take um, a grinder with some, uh, you know, grinding wheels that are obsolete. Make a sandwich, sell the sandwich, you know, together. I see what you mean. Package yeah. it together. Package it together, so buy deal. one, get one free. That's another way to package. So that's one way of liquidation. Uh, we have clearance events, all of these types of things that we can do. Uh, we also horse trade with uh, a lot of our friends out in the industry. You know, so if it just because it's bad at my company doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, you know, if I yeah. go east. Right. 
I know that some of the more creative things I've seen, sometimes they happen by surprise, but donating used goods to a charity gets you tax credits. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. that could be a good thing. You've got a bunch of faucets sitting around your shop for no, or your, your warehouse for no reason. Yeah. And, and you know what, if you donate those, the charity might say, well, we'll cut you a check for 700 bucks for all that. Well, that's taxes that you then get to apply against what you were going to take out of your own pocket. Right. And then of course they're selling on Facebook and Craigslist and stuff like sure, that. But sure, the sure. point is, and, and I guess earlier that spot on the shelf owes me rent. Yes. Yes. So sell okay, it well, today. Do you know good? See, Dom, what, here, here's the reason that most people have a bunch of stuff on their shelf. It's ego. It's all about ego. They don't want to admit they made this mistake. Whoa. Yeah, Whoa. exactly. Yeah. You, just, you just peered into another episode I just recorded, which was called The Anatomy of a Cabinet Shop Foreclosure. Ooh. And the reason this company went belly up, yeah. they were a $20 million cabinet shop, was yeah. because the old owners where they felt comfortable walking around going, look at all the product we have. Look at all the inventory we have yes. on the shelves. We can't lose. Oh, interesting. And I just recorded that the other day. So it is how ego time- driven. It, well, yeah, it's, it's not maybe, you know, not wanting to admit your mistakes. And I think kind of going back to, you know, the restocking fee that we talked about. Yeah. Take your beatings. You made a mistake. <laughs> Move on. You know, it's like, hey, you made a mistake. Take your 20% hit and move on. I mean, I, yes. I always look at people and say, look, you know, you've got a dollar of bad product. Um, if somebody's going to say, I, I need a 20 cent, you know, penalty on that to take it back. I got 80 cents out of the deal. I can reinvest that 80 cents yeah. in, and I can make more money. But if right. I'm just, if I'm so caught up and angry about that 20 cent hit, you know, that 20%, I, my ego is so attached to this product. I shouldn't get, and I shouldn't get a restock fee. You're going to be sitting on that buck for, oh, for ages and ages. Well, let me, you lost let me, the ability to use it. Let me just jump on that. So if Please. I return it and I take a 20 cent hit, yes. I'm now only going to get 80 cents back. Yes. But if I keep it and it's on my shelf or in my yard or in the truck, it owes me rent. Yes. What if that rent was 20 cents? Yeah. Now it costs me a buck 20 next month. At some point, you just have to eat and go, yeah, this thing's got to get out of here because, you know, nobody's move. buying avocado colored stoves anymore, whatever it is. Like, <laughs> you know, Dom, and, and here from a mathematical you know, standpoint, you know, in distribution, we look at it, as I said before, that carrying cost of inventory, you have it on the shelf, it's right. about 2% of the value per month. So if I've got this thing sitting on my shelf, you know, for, you know, a year, which is very common uh, because my ego will not let me get rid of it. Oh, I can do it. I can do it. In a year's time, you know, 24% of the value of that item is gone. And if you think about margins, that's it's a loser by this point. Wow. Absolutely lost, lost any semblance of, of margin. And if I had just taken the beating early, if I when I recognized it was not selling and it was not working for me, if I had just returned it then, take my little haircut, <laughs> moved on, I got that 80 cents, right? but I can reinvest in products that give me a return on investment. Right. Wow. So much here. This is great. It's a, and this might not be the conversation that contractors normally have, but I think you've added a lot of, of light on this. First of all, if you've got some dead inventory, take it back to the distributor today, not tomorrow. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, get it back in their hands. And otherwise just open up the space in your own shop, because regardless that piece of equipment, which could be a piece of inventory, could be that old truck you guys are hoarding in the back of the yard is still taking up space. It is. And it it's got to go. And and, they, and you make money with that space. You're a craftsman. You're, you build stuff. You need space to do things. If you're cramped in there, it's just you're limiting your own potential. Yeah. Interesting. Jason, I know you're a very busy guy in the distribution world. If somebody I try wants to be. To, you are. <laughs> If somebody wants to find you, how sure. would they do that? Probably the best way is to go to the website, uh, you know, the distribution team.com. And on there, I've got resources, you know, how um, obviously how to find me, but uh, you know, things that I work on, you know, and I do private consulting as well, but uh, you know, and they can listen to my podcast as well. So I'm going to give a quick dirty plug for my podcast do it, as well. Do it. What's it called? So it is called distribution talk of all creative things. <laughs> But uh, no, it's been a lot of fun to do. Uh, 
And I think that really for both of us, it's, it's education. And, and we love, you know, to provide content because we want people to succeed. We want them to make money. We enjoy that. And it's, it's a fun thing to do. Yeah. Technology doesn't mean we have to live in silos anymore. Mm-mm. You know, just take whatever city you're in. 20 years ago, you really only got to know the people around you unless you joined a national association and traveled. But right. you w- it would be very, very difficult. And maybe once a year for you to get global insights. Sure. And now when you listen to a podcast, you know, if it's a business one, if you're tr- listening to true crime, that's, you know, whatever. Flips that's your probably. thing. That's, that's okay. your thing. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. But, we all have our guilty pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I didn't give anything away there, did I? No. But, uh, but you can now hear what's going on in other parts of the country, other parts of the world and say, well, how does that work for me? And sometimes it doesn't. It's just entertainment. And yeah. sometimes it does. And you go, hey, I just took a step forward. And the guy in the shop next to me, the company across the street, they're not listening to the same show and they're not taking action at all. We just move ahead so much faster. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I love doing uh, I love doing that because it's, you know, I really look at, at the role that you and I play um, is that, you know, we're honeybees. You know, we, we, we <laughs> That's right. collect a lot of information. We pollinate different places. And I think that's really, uh, you know, that's the reward of doing stuff like this um, is that we want businesses to, to take a listen to what is, what are people doing across the the globe or, or even, you know, just across the city, you know, find out yeah. what is somebody else trying. And I think I can try that too. And re-energize yourself. That's the big thing about it yeah. is get excited about your business again. Well, you are very clearly passionate about distribution, which is yes, a weird indeed. sentence. Yeah. It's, it's a weird sentence, man, but I, I, I do appreciate it. You've added a lot of value here today. Thank you, my friend. As always. Thanks, Jason. We'll have yeah. you back again. Perfect. Love Talk to do to it. Soon.